Hello again. Uh, we're just going to get started with the webinar. Once again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. We know everybody has a very busy schedule, so we do appreciate you taking out the time to learn a little bit more about the Bit Defender uh, MSP program. I uh, just wanted to introduce the players uh, on the call today. We have uh, Samantha Sisk. She's the uh, Bit Defender Distribution Manager in North America. Aaron Sando, the Bit Defender Sales Engineer, who will be delivering the presentation. I'm Rich Jack. I'm the Lifeboat Bit Defender Brand Sales Specialist here to support all your Bit Defender needs. And we also have Beth Klein, the Lifeboat uh, Vendor Partner Manager. One other thing worth noting is just uh, at any point during the session, please feel free to use the chat window to uh, any questions that may arise or any thoughts that you'd like to have addressed. Uh, please uh, just enter those and we'll certainly uh, address them when we have the time or, or set some time aside to do that so at the end. Uh, with that, I'd like to just hand it over to Aaron uh, for the uh, beginning of the webinar. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Rich? Yes, I can hear you fine. I'm thank here. you. Perfect. All right. Um, so today we are uh, going to, I'm going to go a little bit into who Bitdefender is, what what we work to solve. Uh, we're going to do a little high level of our technology portfolio as a whole. I know a lot of people on the call are already familiar with Bitdefender, so I'll just run through the portfolio as a whole at a very high level. And then really the meat of the conversations could be some of our latest updates, some of our new offerings and add-ons that your customers can take advantage of. We'll talk about risk analytics, email security, patch management, and encryption. Um, Throughout this process, I'm going to be doing a console demo um, for for each one of those. Uh, we'll keep it high level, and um, and then we'll uh, wrap up and take some question Q and A. So there's three core requirements to to endpoint security. The first requirement's all about prevention. Uh, if your endpoint security product is so great, you don't need to worry about malware at all, right? You want to ensure that you're reducing incidents that the staff workload is reduced, and um, really the end game is to reduce breaches occurring in the environment. And that takes really strong endpoint security of a product with very high level of efficacy and, and great prevention rates. We like to combine this with a product that also has detection and response. Detection and response is becoming increasingly an important requirement in to today's threat landscape and endpoint security. A good detection and response product should uh, should be very easy to figure out what the root causes of an of a breach of an incident. Be able to figure out exactly which processes were spun were spun up, which files were modified, etc. And then uh, be able to allow the security analyst to effectively remediate the situation. Then the third requirement of today's endpoint security uh, landscape is risk analytics and hardening. If the endpoint is hardened in a manner uh, that that reduces the attack surface, then there's less of a risk for breaches in the first place. Uh, hardening includes things like web filtering, device control, but also includes system misconfigurations that can be exploited. So um, uh, Bitdefender as a whole is able in a single agent, single console manner, be able to solve all three of these requirements. We have the best and most effective prevention in the marketplace. We do this because we have 500 million sensors around the world uh, that we're collecting threat intelligence on and therefore uh, therefore creating a very strong and effective machine learning and, and very sophisticated artificial intelligence. We also have a, a single agent, single console detection and response platform where security analysts can figure out easily the root cause of a breach of an incident, easily see the harm that it did on a, on a particular machine or within an environment, and be able to simply uh, remediate the situation through a number of actions. And then finally, we have very effective hardening. Um, we've always had a very great hardening layer uh, that's complemented our product, but we've recently added risk analytics uh, into, into this layer to, to continuously search for system level misconfigurations. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. Um, before going uh, much further, I wanna mention a little bit on who Bitdefender is as an organization. Uh, so we were founded in 2001. 
And uh, we're very invested in our product, so much so that uh, over 650 of our employees, just about half, are dedicated to research and development and engineering. We don't invest a lot in sales and marketing as we really want the product to be able to speak for itself. We're a enterprise uh, company. We're we our he our enterprise division is focused in Silicon is uh, is headquartered in Silicon Valley, California. Well, like I mentioned before, we have 500 million endpoint sensors around the world. These are in 158 countries and uh, being leveraged also by 150 OEM partners that take the Bit Defender engine and push it out under their hood. Um, and then wrap their own product around it. Uh, some of our OEM partners include uh, FireEye, Netgear, WatchGuard, F-Secure, but we also have some other uh, household names that um, everybody would know of. Uh, now, why does this make a difference for you and your customers? Because we have 500 million sensors around the world, um, essentially we're gathering a massive amount of threat intelligence that we're able to obtain and then uh, leverage to strengthen our machine learning and AI to best protect your customers from zero-day threats. Approximately 38% of global cybersecurity solutions are using our software in some form or another. And again, that just means a massive global protective network to better protect your uh, end users from zero-day threats. We've done extremely well uh, with uh, different industry awards. Uh, we're consistently rated uh, at the top for a high level of efficacy, which basically means the best prevention rates. Uh, we always have great system performance and a low number of false positives. We, uh, we compete in many different industry tests, um, uh, but some of the ones that we're the most proud of are tests like AV comparatives, where it's not necessarily pay to play. It's a fair game for every competitor, and they're, they're really just looking to see who can protect the, uh, who can protect the best against zero day threats, who can have the best system performance and the lowest number of false positives. And what we're especially proud of is we've, uh, come up on the top more than any of our competitors. Uh, we've had eight first place results on AV comparatives. Um, and uh, the, the next competitor that's closest to us has only had four. So about half the number of first place results as us. We protect some very big names uh, that trust our technology to ensure that or their organizations are not breached and they have as minimal incidents as possible. So a little bit about our technology. Um, I know uh, a lot of people on the call are already familiar with Bitdefender, so I'm going to keep this part a little high level. Um, but our core product is this section in the middle of the wheel here, this green section. And this core product includes um, our antivirus, anti-malware, mo uh, these are our machine learning models, our artificial intelligence, our robust signature uh, library. Uh, we also have advanced anti-exploit technologies where we can monitor uh, really, uh, you, could, you can fine tune the monitoring for, for the most commonly exploited applications, um, but then you can put in your own processes to monitor uh, custom processes as well that, that could be exploited too. And you can fine tune the, the security settings for those customized processes as well. Um, we have a process inspector, so we're going to watch all the processes on a machine uh, from the inception throughout their entire life cycle, and we're going to consistently look for malicious, uh, mal malicious actions taken by any of those processes. Then we're going to continue to harden the machine within our core product where we will we'll harden it with our content control, web filtering module, device control, firewall, et cetera. We've recently also added risk analytics into our, into our hardening uh, feature set for our core product, which we'll go into in just a moment. Our add-ons include full disencryption, patch management, uh, which speak for themselves. We'll talk more about those two in more depth. Security for virtualized environments, we're able to offload all of the heavy lifting off the individual virtual machines and onto a centralized scanning server. Resources come at a cost in virtualized environments, so we're going to offload the machine learning, the, the, the AI, all the, um, the, the 
Bitdefender processes that could take up some RAM, off, we're going to offload that off the individual virtual machines and onto a centralized scanning appliance. We've recently rolled out a new email security add-on where we could protect uh, your customers uh, on really any email platform, whether it's Office 365, G Suite, Hosted Exchange, etc. And we have an advanced threat security technology with HyperDetect, where uh, that module can be fine-tuned specifically. Uh, so maybe you're more concerned about some threats and you want to be more aggressive against ransomware, for example, and less aggressive against grayware. You can fine-tune the, the advanced attack uh, to the level, of, you can fine-tune the machine learning to the level of sensitivity that makes sense for the customer security requirements and threat profile. And then finally, we have an endpoint detection and response, response platform as well. All right, so um, diving into our new offerings here, um, I want to first cover hardening and control. Um, in the core product, it's been in the core product for a while, we've had web filtering. You could set up categories that you want to block at, at a particular time of the day. You could create your own customized the whitelist or blacklist. You could block all websites and just allow for your end users to, to access certain websites um, as they need to get their job done, et cetera. We've also had app control, application blacklisting as part of our product, and we've had device control as well. These are uh, device controls where you can block certain USBs or Bluetooth peripherals or Wi-Fi devices, et cetera. These are all great methods for keeping the malware off the endpoint in the first place and really reducing that attack surface to making your network less at risk. Recently, we've also added into our hardening layer our network attack defense module. This network attack defense, this is actually looking at the stream bit. So anything being downloaded to an endpoint, any kind of communication coming on to an endpoint, we're looking at it, we're looking at the bits in transit. And with this technology, we're able to protect end users against brute force attempts, password stealers, lateral movements, et cetera. And we're able to do this protection before it executes on the endpoint. Moving into risk analytics, this is really the core feature, our core new feature within hardening that I want to uh, focus on, spend some time talking about. So you might be asking yourself, what is uh, risk analytics? Um, risk analytics is uh, essentially, um, it's gonna solve the issue of system misconfiguration, uh, those types of vulnerabilities. System misconfigurations is the second biggest cause of mega scale security disasters. And that's a, uh, uh, there's the source on the bottom of the page there uh, that we can, we could send as well. Um, WannaCry, for example, took advantage of an SMB uh, misconfiguration within the actual SMB protocol and had that configure had that uh, misconfiguration uh, been properly set on the endpoints, WannaCry would not have been able to execute. If the endpoints were properly hardened and that SMB protocol was properly configured, endpoint security uh, wouldn't have made a difference because WannaCry would have never been able to execute on the machine in the first place. So the whole goal with endpoint risk analytics is to loc identify the system misconfigurations on the endpoint. Um, make it easy for the admins to be able to, to easily see uh, misconfigurations um, and then uh, be able to go into group policy or on the endpoint individually and harden that particular misconfiguration so that that endpoint is not vulnerable to exploits that could take advantage of it. So our key features within our risk analytics include a scanning engine that's constantly uh, scanning for the system level configurations on a particular endpoint. Um, we're going to look at these particular system level configurations and, um, and when we find a misconfiguration, a configuration that makes the machine vulnerable, we're going to compute a risk score to it and we're going to sort for the uh, of a security analyst uh, which, uh, which risk are uh, make the endpoint more vulnerable based on the particular risk score. We're going to identify this risk and make it very uh, visible to the uh, endpoint. We're looking for 206 different indicators of risk, and many of these risks that we identify can be easily fixed by just a click of the button 
uh, within the console. No need to do anything manually. Uh, in some cases, though, uh, we aren't able to provide a uh, we're not able we're we're not able to actually provide a button to fix the risk from the console. We're going to tell you exactly where within group policy, for example, you could go in to change the setting to solve the misconfiguration vulnerability. Um, so uh, to give this a little bit more of a visual, the way this works is on the top. Uh, we're going to identify the total protected assets in your organization, just give you a risk score that uh, that computes how risky is the particular environment, depending on the misconfigurations that we find. In this example, the risk score for the entire environment is 56 out of 100, which we rank as a medium risk. We're then going to prioritize all of the risks that, that we find across the environment. So uh, maybe there's a firewall disabled for this in this particular example. And that firewall being disabled is across 80% of the endpoints in the environment. This is probably a relatively bigger risk. So this has the biggest uh, risk score that got automatically computated and applied. And we're going to make it the most visible to the security analyst. Um, and so that's what that, that 1240 represents. You can then also drill into the risk by endpoint. So um, uh, in this particular case, uh, this uh, will identify an endpoint name, which is the host name of the machine on the top, and we're going to give it a we're going to give it each endpoint its own risk score based on the system misconfigurations on that particular endpoint, and you could drill into the risk on those particular endpoints. And in the case that they could be solved uh, within the console, we'll give you a button that looks just like this uh, that you can click on, and that risk will be hardened. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like in the console. Um, so within my console here, we've added this risk management uh, uh, configuration icon. And uh, you can easily sort on the top by company, so you could drill into the particular customer that that you want to look for system misconfigurations on. Um, so I'm just going to choose this random company here, and it's going to uh, identify all of the risks across this organization for me. Um, now this is a fake demo company, uh, so there's not a lot of machines. In fact, there's only seven protected devices, and um, as you see, all these numbers are the same because there's uh, it's not a big demo environment. But in a real situation where you have 50 to 100 machines, there's going to be a bigger difference in the risk scores that are calculated depending on the system level configurations on those endpoints. Um, in this particular case, we, there's this risk, this Internet Explorer process risk. I could click on the details on it, and um, down below, we're going to give some advice on how to mitigate the risk, why we recommend mitigating the risk, and then where you can go within group policy or on the endpoint to mitigate that particular risk. Um, down here, this is the risk by endpoint. So as you see, this particular endpoint, the host name is EC Server 2. And if I want to view all of the risks, on this particular endpoint, I just have to click the details button and this will show me all the misconfigurations that apply at this particular endpoint. We'll sort it between those that are automatically resolvable, meaning they can be resolved within the console, and then those that can only be resolved uh, manually. So some examples would be like a weak password, um, the SMB port or the SMB protocol not being configured correctly uh, that WannaCry took advantage of. Is the logon secure? Um, is it missing some kind of client, uh, uh, some kind of client certificate uh, for communications, etc.? And if these risks can be resolved, you simply just click on this button. If not, again, we'll tell you exactly where to go within group policy or on the endpoint to mitigate the to mitigate the risk accordingly. This risk management uh, functionality is now part of our core product, uh, so uh, there is no add-on required uh, for risk management. We're really looking at this as a, a way to help your customers harden their endpoints, um, and uh, we're looking to make it available to everybody. All right, um, so moving on, um, we're now going to talk about email security. 
Uh, this, out of all the new offerings, email security is the one that I'm uh, the most excited about. Let's talk a little bit about challenges regarding email security. Um, organizations are spending tons and tons of money on uh, rightfully training employees to not click on phishing links, don't click on attachments, check the source that an email is being sent from, um, you know, be very cautious with what you click on. Um, attackers know that email is a very, very useful method to, to spread uh, malware uh, across the world. It's very easy to make an email look real, embed a malicious link uh, uh, behind some text, and try to redirect users. You can impact lots of people very easily uh, with a malicious email. Um, I know personally, I get lots of emails that look like they come from my CEO. Um, luckily, I know that I'm unfortunately not important enough to get emails directly from my CEO. So when I see an email being uh, hit my inbox from the CEO asking me to click on a link, I usually do a double take and I can usually find something, uh, something that's different in the, some kind of variant in the name, maybe a, a period in the wrong place, and it's not actually his true email. But CEO impersonation is one type of email attack that's becoming increasingly popular across the threat landscape. But then, of course, organizations still just get the standard phishing emails and, and malicious attachments that we've been seeing for uh, years now. Um, it's, we find that it's very hard for MSPs to effectively protect their customers against emails. So we're hoping that this email, new email security product will help solve that challenge. Our email security product uh, is compatible with really any uh, email uh, email product that's being used. Uh, I know most common, I uh, hear customers using Office 365, G Suite, or Host to Exchange. This email security product can be used with any of those platforms, um, but, but really I don't see why it couldn't work on any other platform if there is a smaller email platform that one of your customers are using. Um, to get this configured, you really just have to change the MX records so that the emails route through our scanning engines before they get delivered to the inbox. Um, we're leveraging uh, the same machine, the same great machine, sophisticated machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, within our email security product that we're using for our endpoint agents. Um, so you, you know you can rely on having the best protection, the best scanning engine, scanning these emails uh, before they get delivered to the end users. Uh, we have time of click protection, meaning that when somebody clicks on a phishing link, before we uh, allow them to go to that final destination, that final website, uh, we're going to track all of the redirects and we're going to ensure that there's no malware between that phishing link and the final destination. Um, we also solve the, the issue of CEO impersonation, CEO fraud. We'll be able to identify when it's not really the CEO emailing an employee asking him to click a link. Um, and we'll be able to take action on that email as appropriate. All right, so let's take a look at what our new uh, email security dashboard looks like. Um, and if you uh, just give me one second here, I actually have to uh, log in. I just got logged out. My time expired. Um, my apologies. So I have to log in with a new console. Um, so within the uh, Gravity Zone Cloud, um, we have this new email security option within here, and you can easily just click open console. Within the MSP console, um, you'll see within, uh, let me just pull up the MSP console real quick. Unfortunately, I don't have any data in here, um, but within the MSP console, uh, you'll see also see the email security uh, tab, and then you'll see all of your customers uh, populate within here, so you'll be able to open the console that correlates with the customer that uh, you want to configure or check the email security platform on. So this is what our email security platform looks like. I can easily see uh, today, within the last day, um, I had one email delivered uh, across my entire environment. So if you have 100 users, for example, that you're protecting, 
uh, this number will likely be a lot higher. Um, again, this is just a small demo environment. Well, today I've had two emails uh, that were, or one, I'm sorry, one email that was found to have spam on it and two emails that were found to have viruses. And then this is also just visualized in a different way in this uh, uh, horizontal bar graph to the right here. I can easily click on these to be able to see uh, more information on the two emails that did contain a virus in my network. And um, luckily, there was a rule on it, so those two viruses did not get delivered uh, to the end user's inbox. And we could do, uh, as security analysts and uh, email security admins, we could do some more, some more forensics and more digging to see exactly uh, what was going on. Just easily by clicking on this uh, details tab here, I could see who the initial sender of the email was, who the recipient was, what the IP address of the sender is will give a, the little country flag next to it so you can see the origination as well. The final action of this email was that it was quarantined. So it never made it to the end user inbox as we did find a virus within this, uh, within this email. Um, there's uh, a first level action and then there's also final actions. We'll talk more about what that means in a moment. Um, but go, going into the actions tab, you'll be able to, to, to view what, what those first level actions were, what the final action was. Uh, the first level action could be something like notify somebody uh, that a virus was found in an email, uh, maybe changing the subject to spam. Uh, that would be a, an example of a first level action. The final action would be quarantine, uh, uh, send to, uh, redirect to a different email address, uh, deliver to inbox potentially. Um, final action is what you actually uh, do with the email, whereas the first level action is what do you need to modify or who do you need to notify uh, actions in that regard. <clears throat> if there were any attachments on this email, you'd be able to see the attachments in the, in, within this tab, as well as any malicious URLs, we would highlight those as well. You can easily get the header information of the email, as well as uh, the server log. So if you ever need to do any debugging on maybe why an email isn't hitting uh, the appropriate place, uh, the, these headers and server logs can help you with that. Um, to set up, to configure the product is uh, fairly straightforward. Again, you just have to change the MX records so that the emails are being routed correctly uh, into our scanning engines. Uh, where we can decide of what final action to take with them. And then um, you just have to set up also the mailboxes within the email security dashboard here. Uh, this can be easily imported in uh, with uh, Active Directory, or you could type in the mailboxes individually. So the configuration is not all that difficult. And we have KBs and admin guides as well as sales engineers that can help you guys, it can help anybody out uh, getting the configuration set up. Uh, with one of your customers. Our rules are, we have a lot of uh, rules and uh, what we find is a lot of times our customers are able to use uh, the email rules as they come out of the box. We do provide the ability for IT admins to modify the rules um, if they need to, um, but it, it could get relatively complex to modify each of these individual rules. But what we find is that the rules that we have set up initially is the uh, is right for most use cases for most organizations. They don't actually need to modify uh, typically any of the, these rules. But again, if something does need to be modified, uh, we have admin guides and uh, we also have sales engineers that can that can help with this process. Um, Clicking on these rules at an individual level, you'll be able to see how they get modified. So for example, the executive tracking, the rule against the CEO impersonation that I was talking about. So if I, uh, if I click on this, I'll be able to uh, set a condition, which is kind of like an if-then statement. Um, you know, you're, you're, this is the logic. What makes this uh, particular uh, email CEO impersonation. We're building out that logic within the conditions here. And then we're building out first level actions. Um, do we want to change the subject line? This would be our first level action. And then uh, the, la the next action would be the final action. Um, what do we actually want to do with the email? Do we want to quarantine it? Do we want to send it to the inbox? Do we want to delete it, et cetera? Um, going back to our rules, just to highlight a few, I mean, we're Oops, sorry. 
Uh, so just to highlight a few of the rules here, um, we're looking for, for macros, we're looking for viruses, uh, we're looking for phishing emails, of course, uh, we're looking for spam, we're looking at links, et cetera. And you can kind of think of this as a firewall. It's priority based. So if an email makes it all the way down the list and uh, none of these rules apply to that email, then we'll just either deliver it and it's uh, either give you a deliver inbound or a deliver outbound. So that's our email security product at a whole, at a, or, um, at a high level, I should say. Again, if there's any further questions on this, which I'm sure there are, um, we could set up one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions to, to go through it in more detail if necessary. The next add-on offering I want to discuss is encryption. Uh, encryption is becoming increasingly important uh, as more and more uh, companies, small businesses, large businesses, et cetera, need to comply to, to different types of regulations. Um, PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, et cetera, typically all require encryption in, uh, in some form for some types of endpoints. So Gravity Zone does have a uh, full disk encryption uh, add-on offering. Um, and uh, some of our uh, core features on why our, uh, why our customers choose Gravity Zone is, um, you know, it protects uh, the, the, our full disk encryption, it protects the laptops uh, if they get lost or stolen. It protects the actual data on that laptop so that it can't be compromised. And it'll help keep a company uh, out of the news if they can say that their, their data is encrypted and that they were within certain uh, compliance standards. Now, as far as Gravity Zone, though, um, we, do make it, we do make the whole encryption process very easy. Um, adding the encryption module onto the endpoint is as easy as just installing it via reconfigure client task. And we'll uh, keep the, the keys. We, we have key management software, so we'll, we'll host all of the keys within Gravity Zone, and we'll make the process for the recovery key uh, extremely easy. We can, uh, if someone ever gets locked out of their computer, uh, obtaining that recovery key for that end user is a very simple process and is not time consuming. We'll uh, talk more about that in a second. Um, something I do want to mention is that uh, Bitdefender does not use proprietary encryption uh, software for the endpoints, which is a good thing. We're using native the native encryption that already comes standard in the operating system. So if your users have uh, BitLocker or file vault uh, machines, uh, they'll be able to leverage our encryption. You won't have to worry about a proprietary encryption uh, algorithm uh, to encrypt those endpoints. Um, so again, as long as BitLocker or file vault is on the endpoint, we support it from an encryption perspective. So to just dive in a little bit on how encryption works, um, uh, the uh, most important part of encryption is within the reports, uh, but let's actually talk about the policy first and how to set this. Um, so like anything else, you'll have to install the encryption module uh, via reconfigure task, uh, which is extremely easy to do within the, within the network view of our, of our console. Uh, you can easily just add the encryption module in and you don't have to uninstall any of the other uh, Gravity Zone security layers that are already on a machine. Um, within a policy, we have this encryption tab here where you can simply enable encryption, uh, choose to encrypt, and if an endpoint has a TPM uh, chip, then we won't have to uh, prompt for a preboot password. Once you install uh, the encryption module and you apply the encryption policy, the end user is going to get prompted uh, to set their encryption password. and um, from from there, uh, we'll then encrypt the machine. And again, if that machine has TPM, they don't need to leverage the password every time they log in. If you have customers already with encrypted machines, we are able to take over the encrypted um, uh, BitLocker or FileVault keys that may already exist on those endpoints. The reports are extremely important, um, as this is where you can easily identify the recovery key. Um, so if I go to run an encryption report here, I'll just do endpoint encryption status and oops, endpoint encryption status, 
And I'm also going to select the company, that, which is my customer, that I want to run this report across. And when I click Generate, um, all of my machines within this company are going to populate within this report, along with which volumes are encrypted and which are not encrypted. So for example, this machine, uh, this uh, laptop has two encrypted volumes on it. And when I click on this two over two, I'll get more information, including um, which volumes are encrypted and the recovery key ID. Um, you can export this report to a CSV in which it's uh, very easy to uh, have a tangible uh, document with the recovery keys for each encrypted volume uh, for each encrypted machine. If someone forgets their password, you simply just have to locate the machine in the network view, which is very simple to do. I'm just going to copy the machine name here and uh, go to the network tab. As long as you have all um, the filter for all items recursively, you can search for this particular machine uh, within the network. And uh, someone forgot their password, they can't get on. You could simply just right click on that machine and go to uh, go to Recovery Manager, uh, put in that recovery key ID that we just obtained, along with your Gravity Zone password. And when you click Reveal, the recovery key will be will will display so that the end user can get into their to get into their laptop and continue working through the day. All right. Um, the last uh, the last new offering that I want to discuss is patch management. Unpatched software is uh, one of the key enablers of cyber breaches today. It's incredibly simple for a bad guy to identify uh, of exploits and vulnerabilities as the vendors are pushing out the CVEs and then oftentimes it takes organizations a couple of days to a couple of weeks to actually patch the machines. So there's typically a window of, of known but unpatched vulnerabilities that, uh, that are existing on an endpoint. Um, patch, our patch management solution uh, helps solve this problem. Again, we fully integrated in, it into our MSP offering along with all the other offerings I've talked about. It's one agent, one console, like everything else. You just need to install the patch management uh, module and apply the policy if necessary. Our patch management um, will, our, our patch management solution uh, will provide uh, IT admins and, uh, to set automatic patching uh, for, for your customers. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to set a schedule of patch scans to run along with a schedule for when you want those patches to actually install. And if you don't want to do it in, in an automated format, you can easily install patches manually. Maybe there's a particular patch that needs to be installed on demand. Uh, you can't wait for the automated schedule time to come up. We allow for the on-demand patching. Um, our patch scans build out a patch inventory, so you can easily find all of the patches that are required within an environment. Uh, within a customer environment, uh, and from there you can easily mass deploy the patch as necessary. A again, if you need to do it on demand and you can't wait for the automatic schedule to take place. Uh, we provide reporting. Oftentimes reporting is critical for compliance reasons again, and uh, you get notified when a particular security or non-security patch is missing. Um, finally, a core component to our uh, patch management software is the patch caching feature. Um, we ha I'm sure all you are, a lot of you are aware we have relays uh, built into Gravity Zone today. Um, and the relays can be uh, repurposed to be uh, patch, caching soft uh, patch caching servers. In this case, the relay will reach out to the vendor website and download the patch and then disperse the patch uh, locally across an environment. Uh, this will this will save bandwidth and um, each computer individually reaching out to the uh, vendor website, downloading the patch at an individual level at the same time, thus uh, potentially taking up a ton of bandwidth on the customer's network. For patching, uh, we support really any Windows uh, desktop or server. Um, 
So to look into a little bit on how this works, um, let's first take a look at our policy and dive into um, what the patch management, uh, how the patch management policy can be configured uh, to meet your needs. So when I go into patch management here, uh, you can easily within the policy point endpoints uh, to a patch caching server. And then um, if for whatever reason that endpoint goes offline and it can't communicate with that patch caching server, it can easily fall back to the vendor website uh, to grab its patches so that that machine will always stay up to date with the latest and greatest patches. You can configure automatic patch scans to happen at certain time and reoccurrence. And then you can also have the uh, policy automatically install the patches for you. You can get very specific. Uh, maybe you only want certain vendor patches to install automatically, like Adobe, for example. You want Maybe you want all Adobe products to patch automatically, and everything else you want to patch on demand in a more manual manner. So anything in this box can be patched automatically, and then um, whatever's not in this uh, box, you'll have to patch uh, manually. So it's just a way to fine-tune it a bit further. And you could postpone the reboot so your end users aren't uh, constantly disturbed by uh, machines trying to reboot uh, during uh, a patch install. Our patch scans are incredibly lightweight. It's not like um, a standard um, full disk scan that you might be used to. End users will have no idea of patch scans happening in the background. Um, and then the result of a patch scan will actually fill out this patch inventory. So I have this sorted by company. Again, this is a, a customer, and I can easily see all the patches that are required uh, for this particular uh, for this particular customer. From here, I can mass deploy these patches if I need to push them out on demand just by checking them off and clicking install. I could then choose my targets um, on which machines I want these patches to install on. Um, I can. Uh, you easily read up uh, by clicking on the links uh, for the bulletins. I can easily read up on the patches, on uh, what they accomplish, and you know why they're necessary. Whatever the vendor pushes out uh, for the particular patches. Um, if there's a particular CVE that you're looking for, uh, something that our customers really like is the ability to search uh, for the CVE right in the search box here, and that exact patch will will populate. Um, we'll also identify for you which products. Does the patch actually patch? So this happens to be, it looks like a, a .NET patch. Um, the patch report is also extremely important as uh, oftentimes organizations uh, need these types of reports to stay within compliance. Um, so we have this uh, network patch status report here that can be ran. Again, I'm just gonna pick a company, which is a customer uh, to run this across and when I click uh, click generate, I'll get the I'll get the status of my uh, machines that have been patched or haven't been patched, and those that still need to be patched. So on this particular machine, this has 35 installed patches. I could click on this to to view the list of patches that have been installed on this machine. I can also see the patches that may have failed to install. Maybe the machine was offline for some reason, um, and then I'll also uh, be able to see uh, which uh, Pass, which patches which patches are missing, and uh, if they need to be installed, I can do it right from the report. All this information uh, can be exported into a CSV as well, uh, so that uh, organizations have a tangible copy of it. All right, um, so that's a, um, a high level of our new offerings and latest add-ons. Uh, I hope I I hope everybody uh, got something out of uh, the webinar today, and I'm going to now pass it over to Rich uh, to discuss some of our uh, spiffs that we have going on to help incentivize you to get these out to our customer base. Thank you, Aaron, very much. We uh, appreciate your time. That was really awesome stuff. So thanks again. Um, just wanted to just remind everybody uh, if you didn't have time to uh, ask a question during this session in the chat window or whatever, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out to us after the fact at any point. If anything does come up or you need further clarification or anything, 
uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to assist you in any way that we can. And as Aaron had stated, uh, Lifeboat and Bitdevender do have a SMIF running currently uh, for Q4, which will end at the end of uh, the calendar year. Um, and that is basically uh, additional endpoints added during that period of time, net new endpoints. And as you can see, first place uh, MSP will be awarded $1,500, and the second place would be $500. So again, uh, my contact information is at the bottom. Please feel free to reach out to me at any point in time, and the team and everybody that supports us is here to help you uh, with any and all of your needs, either today or at any point in the future. So we thank you again. Uh, are, are there any questions that we see today, right now in the chat window or not really? Like there's no questions as of right now. Okay, so again, if anybody does have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. And again, we certainly appreciate your time and we look forward to working with each and every one of you going forward. Thanks again, everybody.